All right, hello and welcome back to the Master Clinicians podcast series. I'm Dr. Frank Aluzzi, I'm your host, and it is my distinct pleasure to uh, introduce a mentor of mine and a close friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Gino Farina. He's a professor of emergency medicine uh, and the assistant dean for clinical preparation for residency at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Norwell. Northwell. Uh, as core faculty in the Department of Emergency Medicine at Long Island Jewish Medical Center, Dr. Farina served as the Associate Re Residency uh, Program Director for seven years and was the Program Director for the next 16 years, helping to turn hundreds of emergency medicine residents into board-certified ER physicians now practicing across the country. As being one of them, you know, it, this is my way of uh, paying back and, and giving thanks to uh, Dr. Farina for teaching us very, very well. And I am very much looking forward for him sharing his pearls of wisdom on reading, you know, EKGs that you cannot miss in the clinical setting. So without further ado, Dr. Frina, thank you for joining us. And I really appreciate having you on the show today. Oh, thank you, Frank. And it's a pleasure to be here. It's always a pleasure to uh, associate with the alumni and the colleagues. Uh, and my pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. Well, wonderful. So I understand you have a library of EKGs that we really can't miss. We have to recognize and know what to do about. So without further ado, if you could uh, maybe take uh, control of the uh, share drive there and just start walking through some of the EKGs for us. Sure. Let me share my screen. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, so we can begin with this EKG. So before we get into the EKG, if you could do me a favor, because you know, this was very helpful for all of us in our training, could you walk us through what your systematic approach is when you get an EKG? You know, you've residents throwing dozens of these in front of you on a clinical shift. What is your approach to make sure that you are not missing anything, any of the subtle findings? You have a systematic approach, if you could share that with us today. So yeah, absolutely. And uh, it is important to have a systematic approach uh, when interpreting EKGs. And uh, I also like to interpret EKGs with a little bit of, of history. Uh, so knowing a little bit of history will uh, keep me into looking for certain things uh, and we can go over that. Uh, but the, the main thing that I like to start off with is, is, is the rate and that you can pretty much by looking at it estimate whether it's fast or it's too slow. Uh, so that's pretty easy. Uh, but the rhythm is super important uh, and you wanna make sure that there's a P wave before every QRS and a QRS follows every P wave. Uh, I have seen many times when uh, people don't do that uh, and the rhythm looks fine and there are actually more P waves than their QRSs and there's actually a heart block there that, that you miss. Uh, and it's easy to, to, to miss that if you don't follow it systematically. So rate, rhythm, the next thing is, is to look at the axis. Uh, sometimes looking at the axis uh, can give you some clues, first of all, uh, if the axis doesn't make sense or the lead's in the correct position because that can cause you to misinterpret things. Uh, there are certain things that are going to give you uh, uh, axis deviations like uh, right axis deviation uh, that can clue you in into uh, perhaps what the diagnosis in, the, 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 what the diagnosis is. Uh, so I, well, having done the rate rhythm axis, uh, then I look at the intervals uh, to make sure that they're uh, within normal or if there's any prolongation of the PR or the QRS. Uh, also super important uh, to always look at the QT. So the good thing about the computer is that it can calculate the QTC for you. Uh, it takes an average of all the EKG leads. Uh, so uh, it can give you a good estimate of, of what the uh, QTC is. Uh, so that's a good way to do it. Uh, and then I look for SCT abnormalities. And I do that uh, SCT abnormalities. I look, I look at them in the way the the, the leads look at regions of the heart. So I look at the inferior leads at two, three, and F to see if there are any changes. I look at one and L, if there are any lateral changes. I look at the anterior leads and I look at the lateral leads to see if there are any STT wave changes. Uh, and sometimes they could be subtle. Uh, T wave inversions are uh, also an important thing to look for. Uh, I've seen many people call T wave inversions non specific uh, when in fact uh, they could actually reveal a fair amount of information. Uh, so that's my systematic approach. Uh, but also, if, if I know uh, if a patient's coming in with palpitations or an eosyncope uh, and they're young, uh, then there'll be other things that I'll, I'll look for on, on the EKG. And we'll go over those as, as I have some examples of those uh, later on. 
Oh, fantastic. No, I, I think it's really and understanding the architecture of the heart and the vessels and looking geographically, you know, especially if you're looking for ST segments, uh, I think it's very important. So I think, I, I, thank you very much for sharing that. I think it's important that we all have a systematic way of, of, of uh, looking at our EKG so you don't miss the subtle findings. So uh, I guess we'll jump into the first one on the screen right now. Uh, you want to give me a, a, just like a, a thumbnail, just brief blurb on, on, you know, what was the presentation? Sure, this is a 58 year old man uh, who presented to uh, an emergency department complaining of chest pain. It was actually not from that long ago, it's actually fairly recent, as you can see the date. Uh, it was 627 of this year, uh, came in complaining of, of chest pain, a uh, little bit of hypertension, and the previous smoker uh, were the only significant uh, past medical history. So risk factors in a good story. So uh, looking, you know, uh, at the uh, the EKG, uh, you know, I generally like to look at lead to my rhythm strip, you know, I try and find the P and then the QRS and then the T. So it looks like we're in sinus rhythm. Uh, the rate looks pretty normal to me. It looks like it's normal sinus rhythm and a normal rate there. Um, you know, if I'm looking at the anterior leads and looking at the uh, ST segments for the anterior leads, they look, uh, they look okay, you know, and I'm going through, you know, maybe the precordial leads, uh, V4 through V6, and, you know, they're looking okay as well. Um, we'll look at the inferior leads at 2, 3, and F, and, oh, so if you look at the ST segments, uh, two, lead 2 and AVF, uh, there definitely looks to be an ST elevation over there. If you look at the baseline, you come over there, there's, it's at least a millimeter, maybe uh, two millimeters. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I would call that an, um, uh, an ST elevation MI. And if you look at 1 and L, I'm seeing reciprocal changes. You know, I'm seeing ST depressions in AVL uh, and uh, lead 1. So yeah, I would definitely call this as an inferior ST elevation MI and, and call the lab. You know, it's funny, I'm noticing, I'm looking at the top of the page, the computer reading there, uh, kind of missed it. It has nonspecific abnormalities and an AV, AV block. Um, I, 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 I tell my students all the time, you know, please, I, I, I would prefer that you not even look at the computer reading, you know, for this reason. Uh, it really can sometimes lead you in the wrong way. I don't know if you want to comment that and, you know, what happened with this patient. So, yes, 100%. Uh, you're right. Uh, often what people do when they're busy, uh, they'll look at for the, uh, the EKG interpretation from the computer and then grossly look at the, uh, at the EKG without looking at it in detail. And that's what happened with this patient. Uh, as uh, the changes on the EKG were missed, uh, it, the patient continued to have pain and it was not until two hours later where the EKG was repeated. And it looked similar to this, but this time the computer read it as an, an acute and fear wall MI. And in fact, the patient had to be transferred in, uh, to go for an emergent cath. Uh, but great, great point and great pickup in seeing this. It's, you could easily miss this, but you have to, so you have to look in, in, in closely and, and there are definitely as the, as a Q wave and which a Q wave in lead three is not necessarily abnormal, uh, but there is a Q wave. There are uh, some SD segment elevations, particularly in three and F and uh, maybe a little bit in two also. But the other, the other thing that I want to point out, in addition to the reciprocal changes, as you mentioned, Frank, uh, absolutely correct. One of the earliest signs of an inferior wall of my could be just an isolated T wave inversion in L. Uh, so uh, this is sort of biphasic. Uh, so it's not just totally inverted, but that's also the reciprocal changes definitely point uh, to the fact that these ST segment elevations uh, are, are probably are true STEMI. Uh, but the other thing I want to point out is if you look at the size of the T wave is as big as the QRS. And uh, yeah. it, normally the QRS is bigger. Like you see here, the QRS is bigger than the T wave. But when the T wave becomes so big, that it's almost ready to tombstone. It's, it's one of the early signs of, uh, of an acute uh, STL segment elevation MI is these hyperacute T waves. I can't really say that this is hyperacute uh, in and of itself, but the, by the fact that it's as big as the QRS. Uh, it's concerning. So that's another relatively subtle thing that can be easily missed uh, on an EKG. Yeah, I, 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 when you're doing medical reviews of, of cases and you're doing your QA, um, because the elevations that meet criteria inferiorly are, are less than those in the precordial leads, I think 
the subtle ST findings are often glossed over, especially if you're led astray by the computer reading. And so I, I think, uh, especially, you know, when I'm practicing in the urgent care, where you kind of, you know, recalibrate your the frame of mindset that you're not thinking that you're seeing as acute of a patient as we are when we're working in the emergency department. I think you have to get out of that. You have to really be hyper-focused uh, at the inferior leads and, and, and really make sure that you're not glossing over something because one millimeter can be missed, but one millimeter is significant. It may, meets criteria and they have to go to the lab. Correct, correct. Uh, so the other thing I want to point here because this was reviewed by uh, QI at that hospital uh, and they asked me to take a look at it for my opinion. Uh, is that you see a fairly tall R wave in V1. Mm -hmm. uh, with tall R wave in V1, you you got to think about lead placements because maybe perhaps the way they put the, uh, the leads on the patient. But you also got to be considering the uh, you know posterior wall MI. Although there's no SD you know concomitant SD segment depression. Depression so there. Yeah. Probably not. But this is also you know when you see a tall wave in R in uh, lead V2, a tall R wave in V2 and V3, uh, think about uh, posterior, posterior yeah. wall of eye, uh, which often goes uh, with inferior wall of eye. Sure. You even should hone you more into looking into those uh, inferior leads for something uh, because it is pretty prominent. Although, again, without the SD segment depressions, it's unlikely that, it's, uh, that this was a posterior wall of eye. Yeah. Well, very good. Good EKG. It's a good review and it's a good way to start off. So I appreciate you sharing that with us. What's the next one? Okay. The next one here. Uh, so this was ah. a 62 year old man who presented with chest pain and shortness of breath. Sure. Uh, literally 30 minutes in, into uh, after he started, uh, he arrived to us in sure. the emergency department. So when you're looking at it, I mean, you go to lead two, you look at your rhythm strip and you have a P followed by a QRS and then a T wave. Uh, so it is sinus. Uh, to me, it looks a bit, a bit slow. Um, it does look like the QRS is a little bit widened as well. You have a little bit of a inter, uh, ventricular conduction delay. Um, you know, the thing that's most concerning to me is you have those big upsloping T waves, you know, the, you know, and it, it looks like in V3 and V4, it's got a depressed takeoff. So um, that's, you know, your De Winter's T wave uh, uh, morphology. And, you know, as I go through the rest of the EKG, I'm looking in the lateral leads and, you know, it looks like one and L. Yeah, you have a one millimeter elevation in one and L. So I would call this a, an ST elevation in my lateral wall ST, uh, STEMI. Um, so that's how I'm looking at this one. Yeah, 100%. So the resident who initially saw this EKG uh, was not terribly impressed with the anterior. It was the new resident, not, not terribly impressed with the uh, anterior leads, thinking that there was only ST segment elevations in lead V2 only. Uh, the resident didn't consider the winter. Uh, but in addition, they thought that the baseline was a little off in leads one uh, and AVL, and maybe there was a ST segment elevations there, or maybe it was baseline, so they weren't terribly impressed. Uh, but just as you pointed, uh, there is significant ST segment elevation. I just want to point out again, the massive, massive yeah. T wave compared to the QRS. I mean, that T wave is so much bigger than the QRS, and here too, it's as big as the QRS, plus the ST segment depression with a rapid uh, yeah. upslope of the T wave, which is pretty characteristic That's of, of pretty the- Pretty classic, yeah. Yeah, pretty characteristic of the winters. Uh, in addition to the reciprocal inferior wall changes where you have ST segment depressions. Oh, sure, uh, yeah. Two, three, and F as well. Uh, so this all point to, to an acute uh, a STEMI. So uh, as we were going over the EKG, actually the patient went into deep fib arrest. Uh, we shocked them out of it. And uh, he went straight to cath lab. So I think the le the lesson uh, that was learned by the resident is some is a lesson that he he would never forget. Uh, as he was trying to have a an academic argument with me that uh, this isn't quite a STEMI, uh, but then the patient proved themselves. Uh, I pity the resident who gets into an academic argument with you about EKGs. <laughs> well, well I, I don't think we needed to even argue about it because the patient declared themselves by going yeah. v fib arrest right, uh, right as we were outside the room discussing the EKG. <laughs> sure, sure. 
So, That's pretty uh, funny. Right. Although well, I'm glad, that, glad it, he did well. He, no, the patient did marvelously well. Interestingly, though, the first uh, instinct of the resident was like, okay, let's get the airway. I'm like, no, no, if we, let's get electricity and shock the patient back. <laughs> Uh, before we take care of uh, the airway, because uh, oh, we can a good talk. teaching case. Yeah. I'm sure he's impressed with the winters now. <laughs> he, oh, he never, for, <laughs> never forget the winters. <laughs> All right. So why don't we go to the next one? Okay. Okay. So again, uh, let me look at the, my what same story or a similar story. Yeah, similar story. This is a 50-something-year-old uh, person who comes in uh, complaining of chest pain. Okay, so if I look at my lead two, it's a P followed by a Q or S followed by a, a T wave. Um, you know, it's sinus rhythm. Um, it looks like it's a normal rate. I'm pretty okay with that. Okay, if I'm looking at the, you know, I'm, I'm looking at those T waves and those pretty hyperacute T waves as you as you mentioned. So you know, looking V two, V three, V four, V five, and V four and V five, and a little bit in six, I'm seeing the ST depression you know, with a depressed takeoff, and then I, I'm seeing the tall T wave again. So I think this is, a, you know, a De Winters variant as well. Um, I'm just going to continue looking at this here. And, um, you know, if i looking at 2, 3, and F, I'm seeing, you know, you know, ST, and I flip T waves over there. Um, I, I, this is, you know, if this is a De Winters, this is a STEMI equivalent, and I'm calling a lab, I and mean, I'm sending this guy to the lab. I think this is a, this is the real thing. So, that's what I'm going to say. What do, what do you have to say about it? A hundred percent, yes. So this is a a, a De Winters again, uh, although this is uh, more classic De Winters as opposed to the other one that had ST segment elevations in V2. This this doesn't have the ST segment elevations. Uh, this has the ST segment depressions with the rapid takeoff. Uh, of the of the of the T wave, and you can see the T waves are peaks. And when you see peak T waves, you got to think about hyperkalemia or acute MI. Uh, are the uh, two things that should come uh, straight to you, to your mind? Uh, so yeah, so this is a STEMI equivalent, even though there is no there are no obvious ST segment elevations. This has to be treated exactly as, as you would a STEMI. Uh, in addition to the having the reciprocal changes in the inferior leads, which really, really confirms your diagnosis. Uh, so just to review again, it's just the, is the ST segment depressions with the rapid upslope of the T wave, whoops. Uh, that's pretty classic for uh, the winters. Uh, STEM equivalent, uh, please don't miss this. Uh, this patient's I, I think this is, that's the take home teaching point is when you see that, that pattern. And if you're not familiar with the winters, you know, you can look it up, you know, there's a, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, a very good literature on that very, you know, in the, in the ER literature, or ambulatory literature. Um, this is a pattern that, you know, your eyes have to kind of, you know, hone in on, on that. And when you're seeing that in an ischemic uh, setting that you really have to treat this as a STEMI and, you know, time is hard. You got to get somebody to a cath lab, you know, to get a balloon up. So uh, I, Again, this is a great EKG. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's move on to the next EKG. Okay. Oh, okay. So I'll get to the ST segments in a second, but if I'm looking at my rhythm, um, what's this, the story here before I start going? Oh, well, again, the same the, thing. The patient uh, comes in with complaint of chest pain and uh, has mm -hmm. a, a noise. All right, so I go to my lead two and I. I see my uh, PQRST complex, and it looks like it's normal sinus. It looks like it's a good rate. Um, I, I mean, obviously, as I'm going, you know, anterior leads, I'm, I'm looking at those very deep ST depressions, and you know, it starts in V1 and V2 and V3 and then V4. And when you see those with the, you know, the, the concavity there, that that pattern, uh, you even mentioned it before. I have to start thinking about posterior MI. I mean, this is the one where you take the EKG and you flip it up and you hold it up to the light, and it looks like your classic ST tombstone. Um, uh, uh, I'm worried about a posterior MI here. I'm just going through the rest of it. Um, you, you know, it looks like you, see, you have ST depressions continuing before and B5. Uh, inferiorly, um, you know, maybe an ST depression in two, but in one and L, you know, it's a little conduction delay, but I'm not seeing anything. If you look in AVR, Maybe a little bit of a subtle ST elevation in an AVR, you know, don't forget about that one, but I, it, it, it really, it doesn't matter. When I see those ST depressions in that pattern in V2, V3, and V4, I'm worried about a posterior MI. This is, this is a posterior STEMI. Yeah, absolutely. So I, li I like to show this EKG because 
people think uh, STEMI's or ST segment elevation of cardio infarction, uh, and they forget that uh, the posterior wall, uh, since it's the mirror upside down image of the anterior wall uh, on an EKG, will present uh, with, a, with a tall R wave, uh, as you see here, and ST segment depressions uh, in, the, in the anterior. So tall R wave uh, and ST segment depressions. If you were to take this and flip it upside down and look at it uh, through a mirror, uh, this would be the equivalent of, of a Q wave and an ST segment elevation. Uh, so the key thing here is that, yeah, so uh, ST segment depressions uh, could be STEMIs, as we saw in the winter with the rapid upstroke, uh, but also when they're isolated to the posterior wall, uh, this is a posterior wall STEMI uh, and needs to go emergently to the cat lab. Uh, so interestingly enough, so posterior walls uh, are usually associated with inferior wall MIs, but this is an isolated uh, posterior wall MI. Uh, often it's uh, associated with an inferior, inferior and posterior. Uh, but this is just an isolated posterior wall of my. Uh, so often when we see posterior walls, we'll see ST segment elevations in the inferior leads, uh, which we really don't see uh, significant ST segment elevations. Uh, there are some uh, T-wave inversions or flattening of the T-waves in, in one and L, uh, which uh, could represent uh, reciprocal changes as well. So, but yeah, 100% a STEMI, uh, posterior wall STEMI needs to go straight to the cath lab. Very good. All right, let's go to the next one. All right, so this is a 73-year-old uh, patient who comes in and has all the risk factors. All I, the risk factors. <laughs> yeah, hypertension, smoker, comes in with, you know, with a good story, exertional chest pain that gets better with rest, and, you know, uh, so all, all the risk factors in a good story. Sure. So, you know, again, we'll start off with the rhythm strip, and, you know, we'll look at V2, and there is a P wave in there, I can see it. And then you have the QRS, which is a little wide, so there's a little conduction delay. And then there's a T. Um, and so we're in sinus. Uh, it looks a little fast to me. So this is a sinus, maybe a little tacky, especially for a 73 year old. Um, I'm assuming a 73 year old with diabetes and hypertension is probably on a beta blocker. So this is pretty tacky for him. Um, and looking at the anterior leads, uh, yeesh. All right. So it looks like there's. I got some ST depressions anteriorly, and as I go through precordial leads, it looks like there's still ST depressions over there. So there's, and uh, let's see, one in L. Also, we got some ST depressions as well. So we have some pretty global ST depressions. Inferiorly, you know, it's a wide complex. You know, it might not really, could be an elevation in three, but it's not an F. Let me go to AVR. Well, there you go. So AVR, I got some pretty significant ST elevation in AVR. So that's that's a good two millimeter elevation, three millimeter elevation. In order to get that high of an elevation AVR, um, probably you know uh, left main or a really proximal LAD lesion with the kind of global ischemia that I'm seeing with the ST depressions everywhere. And uh, so this is this is somebody who's really sick. Uh, this is not somebody who you want to miss. This isn't uh, somebody you're just going to put the telly. I mean, this is somebody who needs to go to the lab and then he's probably going to need the cabbage. So um, uh, what, what, what are you thinking on this one? Yes, yes, yes. So uh, often uh, we forget about AVL, I mean, uh, AVR. AVR. Yeah. Uh, it's a forgotten lead. It looks at, it's on the right side of the heart. It's the right side of the heart is not that big. Uh, and a lot of people tend to, to ignore AVR, but you can get a amount of information from AVR. And this would be one of those cases that uh, always, always, always look for AVR. So when you see ST segment elevations in AVR, as you see here, uh, especially when it's associated with diffuse ischemia everywhere else, or one and L, uh, and then so also a little bit in the inferior leads. It's everywhere. You can see it everywhere. Area. So right. So when you see ST segment elevations in AVR with diffuse ischemia, you got to think about triple vessel disease, of left main disease, or just like you said, a really proximal LAD lesion. Uh, so the the key thing with the, with these patients that uh, they need to go to the cath lab. Uh, they shouldn't be stressed, obviously, <laughs> that they have disease. Uh, they, they should go to the cath lab. Uh, but you probably want to avoid uh, medications such as Plavix immediately before. The, so often when the patient comes in and they go to the cath lab, we'll load them up with uh, 
antiplated agents like Plavix and aspirin and heparin. Uh, give the heparin, you can give the aspirin. You should, if you were to give one of those uh, longer lasting antiplated agents such as uh, Plavix, you want to do this in conjunction with cardiology because if they do have triple vessel disease, uh, you may be delaying their cabbage uh, by four or five days until that right. sort of wears off. So that's just something to, to keep in mind. Uh, just it deserves a conversation with cardiology regarding uh, those longer uh, lasting antiplated agents before you give them. But uh, yeah, this is a person who has risk factors with this EKG. Uh, absolutely, we need to go to the cath lab and uh, don't forget ABR because ABR is actually a fairly important lead, uh, although often forgotten. Yeah, I, I think that is that is a great uh, great message, and this is an excellent EKG to demonstrate that. I mean, when you're looking, I don't I don't think many of the physicians are going to be uh, missing the ST depressions globally, um, but the, the key lead here is ADR and seeing that ST elevation because that really dictates exactly what you what this patient needs, and uh, if you miss it, you can really you can harm the patient by by doing things you would normally do in your practice and then uh, delay getting to the uh, getting to the cabbage. All so, right. thank you for sharing this. Right. All right. Oh, okay. So I'm going to assume same story until you tell me otherwise. Oh, okay. I'll tell you this story. This story, this person comes in uh, complaining of shortness of breath uh, on exam. They have uh, crackles on both lung fields. They have some leg swelling. Uh, and then I guess uh, the significant history was uh, two weeks ago, uh, the patient had really severe chest pain, uh, but stayed home. But now that the, the pain had resolved, and now that they have persistent, uh, well, now that they have uh, shortness of breath and swelling, they came in. Sure. So, you know, what I'm seeing, you know, looking at the rhythm strip, you know, I see my P wave, which is kind of interesting morphology. It's kind of a biphasic P wave followed by QRS. And the QRS is a little wide, you know, there's a little conduction delay. Um, and uh, it's mostly Q, and then it's followed by, you know, the ST segment uh, in the P wave and, and the T wave. So there's the, you know, it, it, you're in sinus rhythm. Um, it is, I'm looking around, and even though you have the Q waves interiorly, which I'll get to in a minute, it is a little bit low voltage, so that's concerning to me. Um, looking at the anterior leads, actually throughout, you know, V1 through V5, I have Q waves followed by, um, you know, an elevated ST segment, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, uh, going into lateral leads, you know, V5 and V6, I have, uh, um, you know, a flip T wave, and inferiorly, it looks like, you know, P, Q, R, S, all right. I mean, to me, this looks like, you know, it's an anterior wall uh, STEMI, um, and given the history, he probably had the STEMI a while back, and he's queuing out, so it looks like he's infarcted. Uh, he has anterior Q waves with uh, continued ST elevations, um, and this would be uh, an anterior wall STEMI. Right, so, so this person had uh, the STEMI two weeks ago, I had acute MI two weeks ago, the pain resolved, so he... He had his MI and completed it. Luckily, he survived at home. Uh, unfortunately, he queued out, uh, right? He lost the R waves totally across the whole entire precordium. Uh, and now he's in heart failure. Right. Uh, so this actually, this pattern here, this ST segment, when you see this QS pattern with this uh, ST segment yeah. uh, like this, you, you got to think about an aneurysm, a left ventricular aneurysm. Uh, so oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So this is and the patient is in heart failure, so lost a significant amount of his myocardium. Uh, as you can see, uh, right, there's no R wave until you get to about here, no significant R wave until you get to about here. So lost significant amount of the anterior wall. So what happens uh, when when you have an infarct that's not treated, uh, that wall becomes weakened. Uh, and you get scar tissue that forms at the base of, of where the infarct, uh, the, the perimeter of where the infarct is, and then you get the ballooning of the ventricle that happens. Uh, and, and then that's a problem because then you get an aneurysm, and then within that aneur left ventricular aneurysm, you can form a blood clot, and then the blood clot can dislodge and embolize anywhere on the left side to the lung, I mean, to the brain uh, or to the gut. Uh, so th this patients are, are, are in trouble, uh, need to be anticoagulated, uh, need to be treated for, the, for heart failure. Uh, but this particular pattern, particularly knowing the, especially knowing the history of 
having had significant chest pain two weeks ago that now has got resolved and isn't heart failure. Uh, this is a, an EKG that's uh, characteristic of, of left ventricular arrhythmia. And he's at high risk for ventricular arrhythmia. He needs an AICD and, you know, we, uh, you know probably a bichamber pacer. His ejection fraction is probably like 10 to 15 percent, you know, this, right. this is in very bad shape. Right. And that's why the low voltage, because he yeah. lost a significant part of his heart. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's too bad. But it's a good EKG to know. And, I, you know, the pattern about the ventricular uh, you know, aneurysm is well taken. That's a very good point. Right. Uh, so not, not all ST segment elevations are STEMIs, right? I sure. Mean, you have ST segment elevations that could be from other things. Pericarditis can give you ST segment elevations, uh, aneurysm, particularly with, with a QS pattern like this. Okay. All right. Okay. Continuing.